Welcome everyone to our first session on Consecration to St. Joseph. We'll uh, do our opening prayer from the book. It's page 240 in the back of our book. There are a series of prayers to St. Joseph that are listed. We'll pray the Memorare to St. Joseph. Again, here is the Memorare to uh, Blessed Virgin Mary of St. Bernard of Clairvaux. Here's one especially asking for St. Joseph's help, and it's uh, fitting to begin our reflections with this one. There on page 240, the Memorare to St. Joseph. Let us begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Remember, O most peace spouse of the Virgin Mary, that never was it known that anyone who fled to thy protection, implored thy help, or sought thy intercession, was left unable. Inspired by this confidence, I fly to you, my spiritual father, and beg for your protection. O foster father of the Redeemer, despise not my petitions, but in your goodness, hear and answer me. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Of course, it's fitting to celebrate a consecration of St. Joseph. We have a special year of St. Joseph has been declared to us this year. But we should ask, answer a couple of fundamental questions first. Uh, many of us know the consecration to Mary, especially popularized by St. Louis de Montfort. He called it a true devotion to Jesus or total consecration to Jesus through Mary. And uh, he was the one to best systematize that devotion. We had the uh, consecration book, though, 33 Days to Morning Glory, which helped us to consecrate ourselves to Mary. We have a similar uh, program approach to St. Joseph. We should answer the question, why consecrate the saints at all? What's the point? Well, the saints, of course, uh, we see they're part of God's family. By baptism, we share with all those who've been baptized, not just those here living currently on earth, but we have the church suffering in purgatory, the church triumphant in heaven, those who have already reached their goal. And they are not dead, as Jesus says. Again, all live in God. So those who have been redeemed by Christ are still alive, and they live more truly than we do. Their souls are alive in heaven. Until the last day, they'll be resurrected in the new heaven, the new earth. So we share one family bond with the saints. And also, from experience, we know the saints get things done. They are classified, especially labeled a saint, because a miracle was worked through their intercession. So to be officially canonized, it means to be added to the canon or list of the uh, saints' feast days in the church, the Eucharistic prayer. They had to, someone asked for their help, and a miracle happened. So the saints are effective in petitioning before God. This doesn't take away from Christ's role as our one and only Savior. It doesn't take away from God's role as our Father. But we see this is how God works. So we can often ask, well, why is it that way? Because it is that way. God chose to make things this way. He could have made, just had one tribe. He had 12 tribes of Israel. Christ could have had one disciple. He had 12 apostles and the 72 that were sent out. God likes variety. If you don't, aren't sure of that, look at nature. How many kinds of bugs are there? How many kinds of birds are there? Fish, all these things. God loves variety. And we see that when God works in the world, he wants to do so through the free will of creatures who can love him. So God works through angels many times in Scripture. He could come down and do it himself, but he chooses, he asks them to cooperate with his will, and they do so. And the same is true in the Old Testament, right? When God chose to save the human race, he asked Abram to choose faith in him, and he did, he became Abraham. And Christ again invites those, says, come and follow me. He wants people to freely choose to cooperate with his plan. And the saints are those who did that. And we're all working in this together. Jesus sent the apostles out how? Not one by one. It was two by two. He said, you're going to need help in this mission, so go out two by two. And they work together. And the same thing is still happening now. The saints are those people. On the one hand, they're also our heroes in the faith. We share stories about people we especially like. Think of great sports figures, historical figures, uh, musicians, people we uh, have a certain respect for. Well, the saints are that to the nth degree. They're those who got life right. They succeeded at being holy. They reached the final destination we're all trying to reach. So the saints also, we have special honor for them because they're our mentors. They're our role models in the faith. And so it's fitting, again, to ask for their help and also to imitate their example. And we see in the saints, there's a principle that God gives the grace that is needed sufficient for that time. So look in the scriptures as well, right? Elijah, able to stop up the rain from the heavens. Other saints couldn't do that. He was given that special gift to bring about Israel's conversion. Or Elisha, again, able to part the waters of the Jordan by using Elijah's mantle. He cleansed Naaman the leper in the Jordan. Right? He washed him and he was cleansed of leprosy. 
they were given certain supernatural powers to do God's mission then and there. Or Joshua, he said, sun stopped in the sky, and the sun stopped in the sky so they could finish their holy campaign. Amazing things. So God gives the grace that is necessary to achieve that special goal. And sometimes more grace is needed because the situation is more dire. The principle that will be mentioned in this book is God gives the grace that is necessary for that special task. And so the most special tasks, the most difficult tasks, God imparts the most grace. And those saints have a special, wonderful power. That's especially true in St. Joseph's case. We know, of course, Mary is the greatest of God's creatures. That means anything God made, any sun, any planet, the entire universe, in fact, isn't as good as Mary. Because she was chosen by God. She said yes, she cooperated to be the mother of God. To be the one brought through whom we could have God come into our world in the incarnation. It's amazing that she's exalted above everything that God has created. But then, just next to her, we have St. Joseph. He is not, doesn't have quite the same graces as Mary, but after her, again, the most exalted human being. Because his task was just as much important, just below that, to keep Jesus alive, to make sure she was safe, to make sure Jesus was safe. And we only hear a little bit about that in the scripture, so we often can forget how important that was and how dangerous it was. The joy of Christmas Day is muted right away by the slaughter of the innocents. There are people who want Jesus dead from the beginning. People still hate Jesus. They hated him back then, too. So it took someone to save him, to keep him safe. And again, did God do it himself? He chose to have a, someone choose to cooperate with his will, and that someone was St. Joseph. So he had, uh, many saints will say he had the most graces of all the saints in history just after Mary herself. So we can ask ourselves, us cradle Catholics, why haven't I thought about this before? Perhaps we're frustrated. Well, if this is so special, why haven't we done this before? Why is consecration to St. Joseph only now coming to the fore? We see this happen also many times in history, that something becomes hidden for a long time until the exact moment it's needed. I think of the Shroud of Turin, for example, right? The purported burial cloth of Jesus Christ seems to be true that it is that, but it was lost for 500 years or so, then found again in Edessa, a Christian city, lost again for another couple hundred years, finally found later and put in the Turin Shrine. It wasn't until 1898 a photographer was taking a picture of it, did long exposures, and you could see the man very clearly on the shroud. You've probably seen that photographic negative of the shroud. That 1898 years, no one saw that. It was very a very vague outline. They could kind of see what was happening. So it took that long for God to reveal this hidden thing. Pretty amazing. And St. Louis de Montfort as well. He uh, preached consecration to Jesus through Mary, and then he said, my writings will be lost, because Satan wants to stop them. Sure enough, his writings were lost. For about a hundred years or so, I think it was. Rediscovered, though, and brought great fruit to the church. And so many popes recommended his total consecration to Jesus through Mary. But again, lost for a time. But brought to the fore once again by God at the proper time. The hidden was revealed when it was necessary. And I think the same is true with St. Joseph. Uh, his special role in the church, only recently appreciated, and this consecration to Joseph, kind of the full flowering of that, only now in our own day coming to the fore. So it's a very exciting time, because God is doing something new. God is always calling each generation to follow him, but we have a special, a special moment in history where the power of St. Joseph, so long hidden, is finally revealed to us. So it's an exciting time for us to receive those graces God has for us, and then to know St. Joseph better, to love him better, and ask for his full help in our lives too. So let's take a look at some of this timeline here. So we'll uh, talk about how to use the book in just a second. Father Donald Calloway has written this book here. And in pages uh, 2 to 3, he gives a little timeline about the, this modern unveiling about St. Joseph's role. So pages 2 and 3 there, he gives a little history of some of these, these things that happened. So again, there'll be saints before this who have talked about St. Joseph. He'll quote them extensively throughout the book here. But this kind of um, bringing St. Joseph to the fore, bringing him in the public eye, wasn't until recent popes that this happened. So they mention here, 1868 is kind of a, a key year right there, because Blessed Jean-Joseph Latas, a Dominican father, he wrote a letter asking uh, Blessed Pius IX to declare St. Joseph patron of the Universal Church, give him a very exalted role. And two years later, uh, Pius IX did exactly that. So there were many other letters written as well. Um, when the Pope uh, declared this, um, he had a decree that named Joseph this uh, patron of the Universal Church. He said about 500 letters he had received. But this one touched him the most. 
because Father Latasso was very vehement and say he would offer uh, many uh, sacrifices, I think even his own life, to make sure this happened, this, con this uh, exalted role of St. Joseph. So very, uh, very uh, good thing to do right there. So 1870, that was done by Pius IX. And then there were some congregations of St. Joseph founded, because this new role he had. Some people said, let's rely upon his special graces we can receive. And an apparition at Knock, Ireland, we have uh, St. Joseph appears with the Blessed Virgin Mary. So he wasn't really appearing much before that. I think St. Joan of Arc had seen him, though. But he appears at Knock, Ireland. And then we have uh, Pope Leo XIII in 1886. He writes a letter on devotion to St. Joseph. We get the Latin title right there. Um, and he uh, wants to recommend St. Joseph now for greater devotion among the Christian faithful. Um, he says why in his letter there. He mentions the times in which we live. So again, remember, it's 1889 when he writes this. He said they're full of misery for the church. We see faith lessening, charity growing cold, the young generation growing in depravity of morals and views, the church attacked on every side, the very foundations of religion undermined. That was in 1889. So many of those things have advanced so much further than they had in that day right there. And so he said, let's ask St. Joseph especially to help us in these times. He is now officially the patron or the protector of the universal church. Uh, and he went on to say uh, why St. Joseph would be effective. He mentioned this tie he has with the Blessed Virgin Mary. And holy matrimony, having that close union uh, of souls, the same happened with him and Mary. And also his role on earth when he was in this life with us, was to protect and to keep safe. He kept Mary and Jesus safe. And so the same role he has now also in heaven. We see that same thing, the saints don't lose their personality. They become fully who God made them to be. So their special loves on earth continue also in heaven. They still delight in the same things they delighted in when they were on earth that were holy and good. So the idea of patron saints comes from there, right? A place where they were from, a special thing they love to do. They're the patron saint for that cause. So St. Joseph, we could say, is the patron saint in a sense of protection, of guardianship. And the Pope said that was a special role to really focus on for him. Uh, he also mentioned the similarity with St. Joseph uh, from the Old Testament. Joseph, um, the son of Jacob, the patriarch Joseph. And again, God uh, does this many times in Scripture. He has something happen in the Old Testament, which is a type of Christ, or something later to be fulfilled. And so Joseph, in one sense, is the type of Jesus. He is sold by his brothers, betrayed by them, sold for silver, becomes enslaved in Egypt. He's imprisoned, so in a sense buried in the depths of the prison. Then he's raised up to Pharaoh's right hand, and he has made then, the, uh, at his right hand, Lord of all Egypt. Well, again, in another sense, though, that ancient Joseph also prefigured the new Joseph. They mentioned, I believe, the name means uh, increaser, the name of Joseph. Joseph gave increase to the people of Egypt. He stored up the grain so they could have food. He protected them. So in the same way, the new St. Joseph, husband of Mary, he also brings protection to the church and supplies for our needs. So he is still fulfilling that special role that he had. And it was prefigured in the Old Testament, brought to fulfillment in St. Joseph, husband of Mary. Um, so he had that special date right there. So the Pope encouraged it. He had a special prayer to be prayed at the end of the rosary. That could be a good prayer to add for this year as well. Um, they mentioned a couple of shrines were built then in this timeline. We know St. Andre Bisset, especially in uh, Montreal, Canada, very beautiful Basilica of St. Joseph. A couple of their churches are going on there. The Litany of St. Joseph in 1909, Pope St. Pius X approves that special litany. That will be our prayer focus throughout our consecration time. Uh, in fact, uh, Father Calloway has structured the days of our retreat after a line of the litany. So it will be very important for us there. When a litany of Laredo is about Blessed Virgin Mary, asking for her help, we have a special one for St. Joseph. So that, that flowering came forth right there. Um, and then Fatima, Portugal, 1917, a very key apparition for our time. Mary laid out the timeline of future events. And St. Joseph appeared too. He appears with the child Jesus giving a blessing to the world on October 13th. It's a very key, uh, key interesting thing there. Um, we have then uh, Joseph added to our prayers, and especially then... 1962, uh, Pope St. John XXIII, he had St. Joseph to the Eucharistic prayer. And there was a big debate, could this even be done? Because the Eucharistic prayer is the ancient prayer of the Church of Rome, the Western Christians. So he had a debate long and hard, could he actually add a name to even St. Joseph's name to this prayer? But they prayed about it and considered it and said yes, they in fact could. So his name then became part after Blessed Virgin Mary of that long list of wonderful saints that we have. Again, our, our role models from the past. So may, massive, uh, interesting thing there. He mentions then uh, 1989, St. John Paul II, 
wrote a wonderful letter, Guardian of the Redeemer. He reflects on St. Joseph's role. That was probably the most um, definitive document on St. Joseph, a uh, papal document. We'll talk about some details of it later. Then, of course, 2013, uh, Pope Francis brings St. Joseph's name into all the Eucharistic prayers. So that was their intention, really, from the beginning. But once they added different Eucharistic prayers after the Second Vatican Council, they forgot to carry through the name of Joseph to those prayers. So they just finished up what was supposed to be the intention. Then, of course, Pope Francis declaring the year of St. Joseph. So we've seen Joseph being unveiled little by little and more widely known throughout the world. Like I said, a very key time. Uh, and especially in the modern day, we see these uh, papal pronouncements especially bringing him to the fore over and over again. Really exciting stuff happening. Um, now let's take a look at the book itself then. Father Calloway designed this to be used in a couple of different ways. So in the book he has, we'll use it as the consecration method. So you mentioned in the table of contents there, he has a little introduction. He talks about part one is the 33-day preparation. So he has uh, 33 days there. He has a special um, focus for each day. This basically follows the litany of St. Joseph. So they reflect upon each line of that litany and bring in saints' writings, different insights on St. Joseph. And as you choose each day there, he will, at the end of the day of reflection, he'll give us perhaps a longer reflection to do. We'll flip to a different page of the book, read a small selection there, and also a special prayer to pray, the litany of St. Joseph being the key one. So part one was what we'll go through that then each of our, uh, for each day of this uh, consecration, starting today with day one. If you see that in part two of the book, he calls it Wonders of Our Spiritual Father. So he reflects upon, much more deeply upon these different aspects of St. Joseph. Um, and so here, this is where, as we go through each day, he'll refer us to different sections of this. He made this so someone could just read through part two if they wish to, just by itself. We'll use it in that way, though. He'll take us to different sections here and there to tie us into the litany reflections. So just so you know, that is there, but we'll refer to it um, each of the days of the 33 days. He'll say, flip to page 97, read that little excerpt right there. That's how we'll use it right there. Then part three, prayers to St. Joseph. And 231, page 231. So there, the litany of St. Joseph will pray that every day of our consecration. There's many other wonderful prayers to pray to St. Joseph, though, like the one we prayed, the Memorare of St. Joseph just now. There's also several acts of consecration to St. Joseph. So you can glance at those and see if you like a certain wording better than another. He has composed a certain prayer. He has some from previous saints who especially had devotion to St. Joseph. And then uh, appendix, uh, the appendix right there, he has appendix A, gives us our group meetings. So here we have some reflection questions, especially those who are watching at home. For each of these group meetings, he'll give reflection questions. And as we go through the consecration too, if you like journaling, you can look at a question, maybe journal some thoughts about it each day. After our recording though, we'll chat about it in our group here uh, once we've had a chance to, to read through the section right there. So we'll use that for our group meetings, and it'll give us some reflection questions to draw fruit from what we've seen, ask questions of each other to share what we have right there. Um, then he has, again, a couple other uh, detailed talks about St. Joseph. Blessed William Joseph Chaminade, Addendum 1. He found the Marianist Order. They founded the University of Dayton, where I went to school. Father Chaminade, their, their uh, beatified founder. And then we have uh, Father Gary Goulagrange, a great Dominican uh, intellectual. He has a great uh, uh, talk about St. Joseph as well. And then there's your travel guide at the very end, 283, Shrines and Churches to St. Joseph. There are quite a few. Our diocese, in fact, has a few shrines and churches to St. Joseph. But he gives us some of the major ones. So if you're ever thinking of what pilgrimage can I take, here's some places you can go, places to see, different parts of the world with shrines to St. Joseph. He's also done a very interesting thing. He talked to some artists and wanted some new uh, artwork about St. Joseph. We have many classical images of St. Joseph. He wanted to get some new ones for us that would uh, really bring forth our reflections about him. So, for example, he has this nice picture of St. Joseph with many other saints, the ones he references throughout the book. So we can see maybe what they look like, how they bring us to St. Joseph as well. He has a couple of different pictures of um, events from the life of St. Joseph, his crowning uh, by his son Jesus, of course, his honor. Uh, Jesus honors his father. Uh, they have this nice one, uh, Jesus and Joseph together. Uh, we have this nice uh, one someone share with us here about uh, Joseph working with the child Jesus right there in the, uh, uh, in the workshop with him. So those might be inspiring for you. They're nice things to meditate if you like uh, looking at holy images. Those can help you perhaps uh, see about St. Joseph's role. And then he has them available for purchase also to decorate our homes. So a very good resource. Again, it can be used in many ways. We'll pretty much follow that part one. 
and each day it will guide us along different pages to read, reflections to have, but feel free to draw upon the treasures of the book if you want to, to do some more things with that. Uh, let's see. Then, uh, so looking ahead, we are just on day one right now. I'll talk a little about the upcoming days at each of our meetings and look back to what we had just done in the previous time period. So to say a little bit about the first section he talks about, the first couple of days, they reflect about the fatherhood of St. Joseph. And there's a debate in the church, should they call Joseph, uh, is he the foster father of Jesus, the father of Jesus? As saints reflected more and more, they say he's a true father to Jesus. Because again, he names the child, that was the father's special role. He taught him his trade, he raised uh, Jesus. And also, Joseph says nothing in the Bible, right? He's completely silent. But in a sense, uh, he speaks through Jesus because we learn our mannerisms from our parents, don't we? The very way we talk, certain families talk the same way, they laugh the same way. So what, when we see Jesus speaking in the scripture, acting in the scripture, we're seeing St. Joseph in a sense. He comes through in his son, Jesus Christ. So the more saints reflected, they saw Joseph is a true father, in fact, the true father of Jesus. And also, reflecting deeper about this, uh, we saw in the consecration to Mary, that uh, St. Maximilian Kolbe wondered, why is Mary called the Immaculate Conception? And he realized she is the created Immaculate Conception. The Holy Spirit is the uncreated Immaculate Conception. Very deep thought about that right there. Well, the reflection reached by many saints here is that St. Joseph is the created image of God the Father. Jesus, of course, is the image of God the Father. The Son perfectly reflects the Father, we know, of course. But St. Joseph is the created, the creature, when made by God, that reflects God's fatherly love. A very beautiful thought right there. So we see the fatherhood of St. Joseph and shown to us um, God the Father showing us what he is like by creating a man after his own heart, creating St. Joseph in this very way. And like we said, our connection with the saints by baptism, Joseph is also our spiritual father. So we gain many family members in Christ by baptism. Mary, of course, our mother, that's been known for a long time. But St. Joseph's role as father has really come through in recent centuries, his spiritual fatherhood for us. Um, a good question is why now would God reveal these things to us? We really see a crisis of fatherhood in the world. Uh, there's even billboards I saw say, be a dad. As though it has to be taught, but it does have to be encouraged, right? Um, so this idea of fatherhood being degraded a bit or some loss in its genius, St. Joseph to revive authentic fatherhood, how we truly love children and receive that father's love. So it's very important for us now to receive that if our own fathers weren't perfect, which whose were. Uh, St. Joseph makes up for that lack of our of perfect fatherhood, but also to inspire men to be fathers and be a model they can emulate too. So a key element of St. Joseph in our current day. So I'll speak about that a little bit, uh, consecration to Joseph, and especially this role as a spiritual father for us right there. And Joseph as well, we'll see his role in the line of David. We know, of course, in the Gospels, we see the genealogy of Jesus in Matthew and Luke. It shows his ancestors, and St. Joseph is in that line. So he's a true successor to King David. Uh, he has that role of kingship from Judah, which he is, of course, the perfect king, inherits that from his father David, his father Joseph. So a very key role that he has right there. All right, so again, we're just getting started here. So the first day is today. You can read that day one reflection. And look at any deeper reflections they have for us. It's a little uh, easier to start off. He doesn't give us too many uh, heady reflections. That first day on page 13 talks about why consecration. And he says two prayers for us to pray there. It's very straightforward. And then going ahead, again, he'll have different prayers for us to pray. But for example, on page 18 for day three, he'll have at the very bottom read our spiritual father. That's in that second part of the book about deeper reflections on St. Joseph. So after you've uh, read his reflections for the day, Go ahead and read that part. It's page 100. And that's a deeper um, meditation upon the special role of St. Joseph. It's a very good thing right there. And that's how the days will be structured from there forward. And so we'll meet then. Uh, it'll be day, the eighth day, right? In one week, we'll get to meet and talk about uh, that part that we've just read and look ahead a bit to what is coming. I'll give you a preview of that. And, of course, any questions you have, feel free to bring those. We'll chat about those in our group. For those who are at home with us too, maybe you have to send your questions by email or put some comments on YouTube. We can respond to those questions also on our videos uh, as well. All right, very good. So again, very exciting. This time that God's doing something new in our midst, this consecration to Joseph. Uh, we'll take a chance to discuss in our group a little bit, even though it's just day one. We'll talk a bit about this time of St. Joseph. And again, those who are at home, you can look in the back, the appendix. I believe it's page 249. That will give you some reflection questions. So as you go, perhaps uh, journal about those or reflect on those and see what God is doing in your life as well with this consecration to Joseph.
thank you very much for joining us. We'll continue our discussion in the group here. And those at home, please reflect upon these discussion questions.